T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start. We have From its first flight in 1981 till its final landing in 2011, the space shuttle was the backbone of the American space program. Built upon the experience gained from Apollo and with the goal of making a reusable spacecraft, NASA accomplished a feat that most thought was impossible. Five complete shuttle systems were built and completed 135 missions to low Earth orbit. They conducted science experiments, deployed and fixed the Hubble Space Telescope, and helped to build the International Space Station, which is in healthy operation still. Using Kerbal Space Program, we'll take a deep dive into each mission looking at the crew, payload, and mission objectives. Join us on this walk through history. And hey, you just might learn something. I'm Cirrus JT, and this is Project STS. Let's get started with STS-1, Space Shuttle Columbia. Let me make sure all the audio things are good. I think we're all set. So, let me get my notes up too. <laughs> STS-1, Space Shuttle Columbia. Uh, the very first shuttle mission um, launched April 12th, 1981. Uh, at 7 a.m. Eastern. Um, launch from LC-39A. So let me go ahead and get this thing out on the pad and then we'll we'll talk about it a little bit further. The first two shuttle missions had a white uh, external tank. They painted it white, um, I guess just for aesthetics. Um, become STS-3, they did away with that to save, it was close to about 600 pounds worth of weight. And who wants 600 pounds worth of weight when you're just doing it for aesthetics when you're launching stuff into space. Um, so little things before before the launch. Oops. Actually, hang on. Hang on. I messed up. I messed up. Alright, roll it back. It's alright. The the first, uh, or STS-1 was scrubbed for two days due to a computer glitch. Um, there was a timing issue with the flight computer. So, I meant to get the proper crew in here. So let me remove everybody. Um, STS-1 had uh, the one and only John Young, which we will... If you don't know who he is, you need to look up who he is and read about him for sure. Um, he is like... He is the Jebediah... As EJ put it, he's the Jebediah Kerman of uh, the space program. Or I guess not of the space program, but of astronauts. So we got John Young and uh, Robert Crippen. So let me get this moved back out to the pad. So yeah, we have John Young as being the commander of STS-1 with uh, Robert Crippen being the pilot. Uh, John Young, again, if you don't know who he is, you need to go and read up on him, but uh, uh, when being selected for STS-1, he uh, was the last active astronaut of his class, which was um, astronaut class 2, and it included uh, other astronauts such as, or names such as Conrad, Armstrong, and Lovell, which, if you've read anything about the Apollo program, you should know who those names are. Um, and it was the second class after the Mercury 7, which was technically the first um, astronaut class. Something he said after being asked about making the first shuttle flight, anyone who sits on top of the largest hydrogen and oxygen fueled system in the world, knowing they're going to light the bottom, doesn't get a little worried, does not fully understand the situation. And Thomas, yeah, that's that's a perfect perfect quote. But again, he... He completely understood the situation. Like, he he just he, he just wasn't scared, which was it's nuts. When we talk about other stuff uh, that happened before the launch, um, and uh, Crippen was a rookie astronaut, so STS-1 was his first space flight. Um, he was a part of astronaut group seven, uh, which we'll talk about more members of group seven um, as we go through these. Because uh, a lot of the astronauts in, in uh, Class 7 flew on shuttles. <clears throat> and uh, prior to being selected, he participated in the Skylab... Was it SMEET? The Skylab Medical Experiment Altitude Test. Which was, I guess, a simulation of what living in Skylab would be. So they were like in a... Uh, not pressurized, but it was just kind of cut off from outside. So they like try to learn how to live and do everyday stuff on Skylab 
um, on the ground. Obviously, you don't have zero G, so it's kind of hard to, to test that, but uh, he was a part of that. And upon completion of that program, he went on to be a capsule communicator um, for all the Skylab missions and Apollo Soyuz test mission. So he's got got a little bit of experience, but this is his first space flight. And we'll we'll talk more about about the mission once once this thing's up in the air. All right, STS-1 launching in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, go for main engine start, 3, 2, 1. STS-1 has cleared the tower. Go for roll. Wow. So as is, as we're ascending, um, I wanted to talk about the initial goal, or at least na what NASA wanted to do with this mission, was an RTLS support. Which during the shuttle program, they had what was it five types of aborts? No, four types of aborts. Um, RTLS was was one of them, along with uh, transoceanic abort, or TAL. Uh, orbit once around, or AOA, and abort to orbit. Oh, shoot. <laughs> this thing requires a little concentration. Much probably like the real shuttle did. Um, we're actually coming up on SRB separation. You ready to turn on gimbal on the SSME? Go for booster set. Check your staging, kids. So yeah, the, the, there's four types of aborts. Um, NASA initially wanted to do an RTLS abort on this mission. And who else than John Young told him, nah, no, you're not doing that. In fact, he had a quote, and I have it here. Um, Let's not practice Russian roulette because you have a loaded gun there. And he's got a point. It's like the RTLS was very dangerous, extremely dangerous. Um, essentially, the shuttle would get to almost here. It had to flip around, burning the SSMEs the opposite direction. Um, and then do to get it coming back to, to KSC. And then it had to ditch the tank, uh, burn off some fuel, and then land. And the amount of maneuvers needed to make that work uh, obviously wasn't tested, and they didn't know if it would work. So you had to end up ditching it in the water or a maneuver didn't work and you ended up going to the other side of the planet or something weird like you're not gonna oop I need to fix my my apoapsis so spin over could you demo RTLS after this I don't know if I could do it we could try it I'd be willing to, to try it So the other aborts, transoceanic abort, is kind of what it sounds like. It's a, you just cross the Atlantic Ocean, and they landed in one of the landing spots over in Europe, or I guess it's probably just Europe. Um, orbit once around, so they would get high enough to where they could go all the way, come back around to Edwards, probably on the west coast. And then abort to orbit was used once by STS-51F, which we will... Um, talk about when we get to that mission. Um, it had to use abort to orbit. Even though it got to a fine orbit and it still carried out its mission just fine. Um, but that's the only mission that an abort like that was used. Oh, he also, or John Young also said regarding um, coming up on main engine cutoff. Main engine cutoff complete. Okay. SSMEs are stowed and shut down. Opening little fuel tanks. I'll tell the quote here in just one second. Unfortunately, Kerbal doesn't have a way of doing this via an action group or anything, so... Once I get these enabled, we'll go ahead and separate the ET. Oop, I missed one. Okay. Orbiter's fuel tanks are primed and ready. 
Go for activation of OMS. And ET set. I've always wanted to get that camera shot. Let's see. Kind of got it. You know, that iconic shot of, uh, of the uh, ET burnt and stuff floating away. So yeah, John Young also said about the RTLS is that it requires continuous miracles interspersed with acts of God to be successful. And when you put it like that, uh, definitely seems like it would be not a thing you'd probably just want to test. And like, you'd rather just test putting the thing in orbit than shoot. Because it did seem like the couple of the first uh, shuttle missions had highly eccentric orbits, and then the later missions got more cir more and more circular as, as time went on. Which, when you're just testing to get to orbit, you probably don't need a perfect orbit, so... Um, okay, I think this is a good time to talk about... Well, let me bring up the support crew as well, because a lot of these names of the support crew for, for these STS missions, um, the names will come up later on um, in later missions. So the Ascent Capcom for this mission was uh, Daniel Bryden, Bridenstein, which is kind of funny. I don't think he has any relation to Jim, but who knows? Um, also Henry Hartsfield and Joseph P. Allen, who is the re-entry Capcom on this mission. Again, remember these names because uh, we'll be talking about a lot of them later. And open up the payload bay doors. A good time to talk about the payload for this mission, which for STS-1, it's pretty straightforward. They had a, what was called a DFI package, um, what was called a Development Flight Instrumentation Package, which was just a bunch of sensors, essentially. It's like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example uh, that we had recently that had a bunch of sensors strapped to it. I guess like a lot of the engine tests, like the Raptor tests um, that SpaceX were doing with all the sensors strapped to the engine. This thing kind of did the same thing, and this this is kind of mimicking the DFI. Um, but it was just meant to measure stress levels on the orbiter during ascent, um, orbit, and re-entry and landing. Um, it measured like, a couple other things, like temperatures and all that kind of stuff. They, they wanted as much data as they could get. Um, other than that, that, that's kind of all they did. They had a bunch of other flight test object objectives ahead, um, 113 in total. All of them they completed without a problem. Um, a lot of it was just testing shuttle systems while in orbit to make sure you know nothing was busted, everything made sense. Um, a lot of the habitation systems too were tested. Um, AKA like toilets and making food and all that. Um, all the typical stuff you'd want to test when trying to certify a reusable craft, right? And they pretty much um, orbited, for what, how long was the mission duration? It was two days, I believe, for two days, and then came back down. I don't like how KSP zooms in and out as I scroll through this document. <laughs> um, a few other cool things to note. A couple firsts that happened during STS-1. Uh, the first one being, it was the first time solid rocket motors were used on a crewed um, test. If you don't count escape towers, which I don't think you can. Because um, like the, the escape tower, tower, tower? The escape tower on Saturn V um, obviously uses um, solid rocket but and it was also the first crewed mission to not to launch without an unmanned mission first um, which is crazy to think about um, which makes this mission uh, that much more like not crazy is not the word I was thinking of but just like we're gonna send a reusable craft that we've never sent to orbit before we don't quite know if it's gonna work. Do you, do you guys want to do that? And Young and Crippen are like, yeah, sure, yeah, we could, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring it to orbit. We'll test it. It'll, it'll be fine. And they did. It's crazy. Um, another thing to note while in orbit, they did have two EMUs. So if they had to spacewalk for some odd reason, um, Crippen would be sent out with uh, John Young as his backup in case something else went wrong. Uh, but yeah, if they had to spacewalk, they had the capability to do it. 
Um, luckily, they didn't have to. Electro Lemon Ice Shuttle? Nice. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, actually. I should have mentioned at the beginning of the mission. This flies back. Uh, the Shuttlecraft file is provided by Snackless Kerbal, which most I think most people here in chat know who he is already. But he graciously is or gave me his craft file for his shuttle. Um, it is extremely well done and performs very, very well. But yeah, I did not make this. I did not make this. I was thinking about doing that, but then Snackless offered his up, and I'm like, well, I mean, I'd rather use a shuttle of somebody who's a much better craft builder than me. Um, it just made sense, so. Um, my last kind of tidbit I had before we, we deorbit um, this thing and land it is at T-9, uh, T there was a hold uh, for a message to be read that was written by President Ronald Reagan. And that message was, uh, John, we can't do more from the launch team than say, we wish you an awful lot of luck. We are with you 1,000%. We are awful proud to be been part of it. Good luck, gentlemen. Which, coming from the president, and probably you're, you're puckering pretty hard once this thing is lit. Like, you're going to need all the luck you can get, for sure. RJ, you don't know who that is? I figured. <laughs> So yeah, that's kind of all the tidbits I had in STS-1, so let's go ahead, I think, and uh, bring this this guy back down. Um, like I said, th this one's kind of not exciting once you get to orbit, just because they didn't they didn't really do much. They didn't have a Canada arm. Um, that comes next mission. They didn't have any payloads to jettison, so we'll just go ahead and uh, lock up the payload bay, and we'll send it back down. Okay, your burn in five. Four, three, two, one. Vincent D. burn. I purposely did not go into technical details um, of the shuttle itself. Um, mainly, uh, one, a lot of the nitty gritty details, I don't, like, well, one, I don't know them. And two, it'd just be easier, I think, than me sitting here rattling off all the numbers about mass and thrust and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it'd just be easier just to just to look them up. Um, I could provide resources to that if if people want. But just sitting here rattling off numbers is um, I don't know. Could be entertaining for some, not all. But what's really interesting are definitely the SSMEs. So if you're going to look up any information, definitely do research in the SSMEs, especially with SLS coming up. Um, although they're going to be uh, dumped into the ocean instead of reused on um, a space shuttle, but those en the engines are incredible. There's some NASA documentaries on YouTube, too, uh, that show some of the engine tests of the RS-25s that, <laughs> that was, all the early testing wasn't all all roses, that's for sure. Okay. The orbit burn's almost complete. And once we the orbit burn's complete, um, we'll lock the OMSs, um, get reorient reoriented for reentry, and then we'll start fuel dump. So we want this orbiter to be as light as possible. Yeah, this is definitely, well, I mean, it was probably the hardest part for the shuttle itself, but also the hardest part for me <laughs> is the landing after re-entry. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into an STS-2 that, uh, sometimes they flew the thing down by hand, which they did land by hand, um, through most of the early missions, but, uh, to come down through re-entry by hand, oh man. Nerves of steel. To be at the joystick when you got all this this heat and plasma around around your plane, I guess. Get down to three sixteen. Okay, I'm gonna kill fuel dump. All right, we have made it through reentry. We're a little bit off. I think we're I think we're good. 
All right. These will do pitch. Roll. Yaw. Pitch. Okay. Elevons are activated. I have confusion. Off. Okay. And we've got stick control. We're still going a little bit fast, but we'll lose that speed soon. So this is where some RCS leftover is helpful. I am using a joystick to land this. I don't trust myself using the keyboard to uh, to land. All right, I could do like I did earlier. I could just land it like this. Because at this point, I don't really need the numbers. I could sight line it. You might still make it. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's probably going to stall before. I get that far. It's coasting nicely, though. It's coasting very nicely. Oop, I meant to press C. I'm smart. <laughs> I didn't say you weren't. Didn't say you weren't. Oop. Camera's freaking out. Totally freaking out, man. There we go. Kind of wish I'd, I'd, uh, I had escort. KSP2, man. KSP2. Can you imagine somebody coming in, flying the shuttle in, having two fighter jet escorts? Dude, that, that's going to be so sick. So much fun. You're going to stall if you don't pitch down. Yeah. I'm keeping an eye on it. I'm trying to keep find that happy medium where it doesn't lose too much speed. Yeah, we're, we're going to be short of the runway, which is all right. If I get past this last hill here, we'll just land in the in the grassy area by KSC. Thomas would go inverted over you. <laughs> he totally would. <laughs> yep. And if you had uh if you had VoIP, he would for sure have danger zone playing. You're gonna do reentry shuttle test now. I've I've got I've got you wanting to do them. KSC, we're gonna be short of the runway. Uh, Roger that. Columbia. We were like, what a hundred. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna hit hard. Hard landing. Touchdown. Shoots deployed. <clears throat> also deep into official documents from NASA. <laughs> oh, nice, Thomas. This actually doesn't slow the shoot. I'm actually surprised the shoot doesn't slow down all that much. Brakes are also a bit much. All right, touchdown of STS-1, which this kind of mimics, in a way, the actual landing of STS-1, because it landed uh, up until STS-4, they landed in a field, or not a field, but they landed in a lake bed anyways, so. Accidental realism. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Brakes. Um, so other than that, I think that's all I have for STS-1.